Well, Australia is in the grips of a well-documented housing crisis as home prices continue to climb with demand still outstripping supply. This is an economy being buffeted by global uncertainty, uh, price pressures and higher interest rates. The Reserve Bank Governor has extinguished any lingering hope of a rate cut this year, saying the discussion is premature. Aussies are still waiting for that rate cut. Everything still seems to cost too much and the housing crisis isn't going anywhere soon. But amongst all the doom and gloom, there might be one bright spot. Have you checked your super fund balance lately? Hello, I'm Chris Burke and welcome to the Bloomberg Australia podcast. Today on the show, we look at how super funds have been giving us some pretty good bang for our bucks lately. Is there a secret to their success and how long can it last for? Today, I'm joined by Amy Bainbridge, who spends her days here in Melbourne poring over the investment decisions of every super fund in the land, so you don't have to. Amy, thank you for your service and welcome <laughs> to the podcast. Hi, Chris. Nice to be here. So you've been schmoozing with some key decision makers from our biggest super funds over the past week, both down here and in Sydney. Before you tell us all about that, Amy, I've got a bit of a bone to pick with you. Your recent stories have been telling us that the Americans are salivating over our superannuation system and the Brits are seething with jealousy. Meanwhile, we're constantly being told by politicians uh, over here that our retirement system is the best in the world. Now, that's not exactly true, is it? Uh, look, it's true in part. I mean, we're doing OK. Actually, we're doing better than OK. Of the 48 systems that were ranked in the recent Mercer CFA Global Pension Index, which comes out every year, we came sixth. Uh, we get a B plus. Uh, we have sit now behind Singapore, so we slipped one ranking uh, this year. The report looks at the adequacy, sustainability and integrity of pension systems, or as we call them, superannuation systems around the world. The biggest issue they have with our system, while we're not getting an A grade, is that there isn't a big enough focus on income in retirement. That's according to the report's authors. So they've said that we've had this great system to accumulate or save money, but the next really big focus needs to be on the retirement phase. And that's a, a big issue I know we've, uh, that you've been talking uh, a lot about, and that's probably another podcast entirely. <laughs> um, but uh, Mary Dalhante is the head of the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia. She was on Bloomberg TV a few months back uh, talking about Australia's super funds and their place in the world. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. No system is without its flaws, but is this the most sort of perfectly imperfect pension system in your view? It is something to be incredibly proud of, I think. The nation has built something over only about 32 years. That is the envy of the world. More than three decades. That's a, that's a long time uh, that Aussie, Aussie firms have been contributing to super on behalf of workers. Uh, what the system was created way back in the early 1990s. What were you doing back then? I was still in school, Chris. Uh, hoping to get my first job probably so I could start contributing mm. to my superannuation. Yeah, I don't think we need to go into what I was doing back then. But um, all those all those regular and rising payments, has uh, they've built up a truckload of money, right? Um, do you have some numbers for us? So we're about to tip over the $4 trillion mark for Australian superannuation. Inflows are huge. Um, employers are contributing. In the last financial year, contributed $137 billion. And then on top of that, people who chose to make extra contributions... Uh, that was close to, to $50 billion, sitting around the $47 billion mark. Worth noting, of course, that part of this story is that the contribution rate of, you know, the equivalent um, salary of 11.5% has just gone up. Yep. It's going up again to 12% in the middle of next year. So we are going to see, I guess, that natural growth as more money comes into the system. And what did that start at, that, that rate? 3%, which is really... 3%? 3%. Wow. Uh, and it's it's really interesting because a lot of the people retiring now started their journey in superannuation at that lower contribution rate. Mm. Of course, that's gradually risen over the years, but that goes to some way to explaining why balances aren't quite where they could be or should be or where some people would want them, but they will grow over time. And of course, you've got to remember the wage growth component to that too, because this is based on a percentage of, of, of wages. So $4 trillion dollars. We're almost there. Those, uh, those numbers are huge. Um, all that money has to go somewhere, right? Uh, give us, can you give us a broad overview of, of how that money is currently invested? 
So, Chris, I'm looking here at the latest industry data from APRA. That's one of the main regulators of the industry. It shows that about 52% of all of our retirement money is currently sitting in equities as a whole. Of that, global stocks is just shy of around 30% and the local domestic equities is around 22.5%. Um, about 20% is in private markets, so that's when you're looking at unlisted infrastructure and property, unlisted equity and private credit. Private credit is a, a market we're talking a lot about at the moment, but it's still less than 1% of, of industry assets. So that is likely to grow and something to really keep an eye on. But if you look at, I guess, the, the last year or so, a lot of the funds really have had that bigger exposure to equity. Some have been moving in and out as there's been the, the booming stock markets and they've tried to capitalise on that. Look, if I wanted to take a, a much deeper look into into those numbers and, and, and break it down by, you know, what, what are the names of the actual uh, equities uh, I'm invested in and and what kind of private markets, you know, what uh, what what kind of assets uh, do I indirectly ha- have a stake in? Um, how easy or difficult is it for 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 me to do that? Depends how much patience you've got, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to say that. Um, I have seen the, the, those spreadsheets, and, and you kind of tearing your hair out um, at, <laughs> at your desk. <laughs> But if, let's 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 say if I was uh, if I was at home right now and I and I wanted to Google those uh, those details, what what do I do? So whatever your super fund is called, Google that name and portfolio holdings disclosure. Such a you know exciting term, but that is that is what it will bring up for you. And every six months, every super fund now has to disclose what they're invested in, uh, and you'll get this. Well, some would say a beautiful big spreadsheet. I would say a rather alarmingly large spreadsheet. But what you can do is look through and you can actually see um, the shares that your fund holds and then, you know, investments in other funds. But you don't always have the full visibility of the assets. If your your money is pulled into, say, um, some sort of equity fund, you might not necessarily know what asset that, that private equity fund has then invested in, which is one of the big challenges, you know, when reporting and covering on this in, and covering this industry. So, Amy... I don't mind telling you that uh, when I came home from work on Friday, uh, my latest super fund statement was waiting for me. Uh, I thought of you. What I what I did see was uh, was uh, quite pleasantly surprising. Actually, uh, it gave me a uh, said I'd made a twelve percent return for the uh, year through June. I know that's a bit behind, um, but um, how am I doing when compared to the average uh, the average industry return? Well, depending on what you're invested in, um, if you know a lot of the high growth. Um, funds, so perhaps a greater exposure to equities, for example, uh, in the year through to, to June, um, returned easily in the double digits. So that was that was a strong story. A lot of the my super or the balance funds, what I call the, the meat and potatoes investments that you'll get defaulted into if you don't choose another option, um, they were more around the 9%. Um, what super ratings, one of the research houses has said in the latest figures is that from, for the September quarter, so the first quarter of the financial year, the returns were 3.4% for the median balanced option. And that would make it the strongest first quarter since 2013. Wow. So what are the main drivers of those gains? What's making our super returns this surprising bright spot? Uh, Chris, it's really all about the booming share markets. And that's both here in Australia and overseas. Last week, according to my Bloomberg terminal, we saw the US benchmark, that's the S&P 500, smash its 47th record high this year, which is pretty mind-boggling. So yeah, it's really no secret. It's been really strong in equities. You know, in September, we had the the Fed Reserve cut interest rates. Um, There's a bit of stimulus in China. Um, But really, I guess the questions are around now whether how likely that stock rally is to continue. We've already had Goldman Sachs out saying that, you know, the US stocks, for example, are unlikely to sustain their above average performance of the past decade. And I think a lot of the super funds are really now switching their minds to that and how to position for the next next gain and which sector it will be in. When we come back, things are looking pretty volatile out there. So what are super funds doing about it? Amy, so you've been out and about meeting a bunch of super fund execs over the past week or so. Let's start with Mark Delaney, who's the country's most powerful chief investment officer because he works for Australian Super, 
our biggest super fund. I think it's uh, more than $340 billion of assets right now. Um, so you ran into him when he was speaking at a Bloomberg event in Sydney last week. Now, any Aussie that's got money invested anywhere is, is really interested in what he has to say. With so much volatility in markets, uh, some of which was caused, uh, as you said, by the, the massive wave of stimulus that China just unleashed. Let's take a listen to what he said on China. So the authorities have been really keen to try and keep house prices steady while allowing the housing market to right size. And all the measures that they've done announced in the last week is really about trying to put a floor under this so it doesn't feed back heavily into consumer spending and start that negative cycle you've seen in other housing buzz. So obviously anything supportive of the Chinese economy is good for Australian markets. Uh, but in terms of direct investments, do we know how much Australian super or, or other super funds actually hold in Chinese shares? So a lot of the super funds have told me in the two years that I've been doing this job that they've maintained exposure to China, but they haven't really been getting in or reducing so much. Australian super has about $3 billion uh, invested in China or less than 1% of their total assets. Now, the majority of that is in international shares um, and they're close to market weight for global equities. Um, look, I spoke to the head of asset allocation, Alistair Barker, last week. He went to China about a month ago and he acknowledged that, you know, getting that on the ground experience is, you know, just really good to to see, get a, a lay of the land, speak to people and see what's going on. He said, as a, I guess, a house view from Australia Super's point of view, there has been some improved sentiment, but their view at the moment is it remains to be seen whether enough has been done on China to look at raising your exposure right. again. Tell us a bit more about what that job entails and, and what he's telling you about, about their investment plans. It was an interesting conversation, Chris. So Alistair Barker's role, as you said, head of asset allocation, basically means he's responsible for the, the broad direction of how the fund's portfolios are invested for the members. And he's always got a good high-level view on what's happening with the investments right across their portfolios. Basically, he said, look, they, and we know this from previous reporting, that they'd increased um, their allocations to Australian and, and global equities, but they're really cognizant of the fact that global global equities and particularly US equities are trading on the expensive side. So now they're really looking to see where the next best returns could be. Uh, private markets is really where they're looking. And they told me that they've got a current allocation of about 23% to unlisted assets. That's going to be edging above 30% in the next three to five years. And recently, my US colleague, Josh Saul, revealed Australian Super had bought into data centre developer Data Bank. Um, they were part of this $2 billion US dollar raise. Um, they're going to build three facilities across the US. And that's one of the big investing themes at the moment. A lot of the super funds are talking about data centres. And that's, of course, powered by this, this AI boom. Um, of course, though, we know that not everything in private markets always goes to plan. Uh, we saw Australian Retirement Trust and Aussie Super reveal losses on US education software firm Pluralsight Inc. That was a little while ago um, when private credit lenders take, took ownership of that company. And also we know that regulators are very much looking at private markets exposure and whether valuations are really in line with, with where they should be and what the funds are reporting. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big story, which um, I think we're going to see a lot more in that space. Okay, so equities have been going gangbusters uh, for, for such a long time, and, and now they're looking for the next big thing, basically. So you were on a bit of a roll last week. You also ran into Andrew Fisher, who's the head of investment strategy for Australian Retirement Trust, which, well, I would say they must be Australian Super's biggest rival, right? Um, what are they? What are they up to? when it comes to spending our hard-earned money. <laughs> That's right. I mean, they, you know, we did have quite a long conversation about how tricky it is positioning in the current environment because, you know, views keep changing, the markets are pricing in this rate cut and then the view will change again. But they haven't changed from their, their scenario that it will be a soft landing more broadly. What they're now looking to is is in the real assets asset space, so infrastructure and property. Uh, that's what they're going to be looking for next. Andrew Fisher said, look, they saying that they've been in a holding pattern is far too strong a word, but that is kind of the essence of where they've been at. They're kind of waiting to see how things how things play out, but they have enormous inflows coming in as well. So at some point you really do um, need to go forward with your plan and certainly uh, real estate and infrastructure is where they're going to be looking domestically but globally really over the next little while. 
So as you mentioned before, we probably shouldn't be getting too used to, uh, to, to seeing these above average returns from, from our super funds. Should I be rethinking my plans to retire to that villa in Tuscany with a pool? <laughs> Look, it, it's really worth getting across what investment you're in. Like That's what I say to people. People come to me all the time and say, look, is my super fund a good super fund? One of the best things you can do is think about what you hope to get out of retirement, but also how far away it is. And look at the investment you're in. You know, is the balanced option the best for you? Could you be in high growth? Do you have views on, you know, socially conscious investments in the things and things like that? We do know there's a lot of geopolitical uncertainty ahead. That's going to impact markets. That's no secret. Um, we are expecting rate cuts, of course, but as we all know, uh, superannuation is a long-term investment. So the investment chiefs are looking at long-term gains, not necessarily the bumps and, you know, the, the highs and lows of the current market situation. So you've always got to look at the big picture. Amy, it's been a pleasure. Sorry, I mean, it's been really super <laughs> to have you on the podcast this week. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Australia podcast. I'm Chris Burke. This episode was recorded on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulan Nation. It was produced by Paul Allen and edited by Ainsley Chandler and Rebecca Jones. Don't forget to follow and review the show wherever you get your podcasts and sign up to Bloomberg's free daily newsletter, Australia Briefing. Go to Bloomberg.com to subscribe.